You did well by sticking with us. And in the wake of so many suggestions as to how the judiciary can improve, we have come to appreciate the work of some selfless and compassionate lawyers who have worked all their lives to make the judiciary a better place. And I'm privileged to have one of such revered lawyers with me in the studio. How do I describe him? <laughs> Let me borrow the words of Chief Justice, Her Ladyship Georgina Tudora Wood, in describing him as a fearless advocate for the rule of law, truth and integrity and this has won him the respect of uh, and admiration of his peers, juniors and even his harshest critics. A true compatriot, a great disciplinarian and the list is endless. Counsel Sam Okujetu, affectionately called Uncle Sam, is my guest this afternoon and <laughs> the name is a household name, you know. He is a renowned lawyer. He is a former uh, president of the Ghana Bar Association. He's held several high-level positions, including chair of the International Advisory Commission of the Commonwealth Human Rights Initiative and a member of the Commonwealth Lawyers Association. Uh, this afternoon, we're going deep into an autobiography he has put together. He tags it, A Life to God and Country. Council. It's a great honor to have you in the studio. You're welcome. Pleasure is mine. And having you here, it will only be fair to uh, gauge your mood on the current lawlessness uh, we are seeing in our country. It is disturbing. Just to put it mildly, it's very, very disturbing. I have watched this country over the years, but one would have thought that there should be improvement, but it's taken the other way around. Daily, we find that there is so much indiscipline. People taking the law into their own hands. I think I heard about yesterday, a soldier was jogging in the morning and he was lynched. Exactly the point. What, what excuse? You find, sometimes they say, thief, thief. You put you on a car, they say, jeweler. And then they think that they pass upon such a person and kill him. I think you heard about the necklace before, where they actually put the tire on you and set you on fire. Definitely. Well, the question is that, how are we even sure that that person is a thief? That's a question all of us are asking now. And this is the reason why the law is very clear and say that the person is deemed innocent until, proved. until he's proved guilty. And those who are doing it, sometimes I say they should reverse the clock and look at themselves that they could be the victim or their family member could be the victim. So every time you must look at it from the other side and say, could that not be me? If you suspect the person to be a thief, well, at least the law is there. That's why we have police. Report him or even arrest him and take him to the, to the police. police. Of course, not forgetting that if you arrest him and it turns out that he wasn't the person, <laughs> you also you be in trouble. trouble. <laughs> <laughs> because he will have a right of action against you. Yes. <laughs> so it is disturbing. I think we need to do something about it. And whose responsibility is it? Nice to question. Uh, I think that is the responsibility of all of us. I unfortunately found myself now in the Council of State and I've raised this issue with them and said, perhaps we need to marshal a national to borrow a word, crusade on discipline. And discipline can take several formats because you see that we get choked gutters, not so? Yes. And then the rains come, and then what happened? There's Flood. flooding, people's house gets flooded, some people die in the process, and yet we are causing it. <laughs> and so if we all can learn to understand that the dust, the rubbish, is for the rubbish dump and not for the gutter. And then when you buy sachet water and you finish drinking it, you don't throw the sachet around. Put it somewhere. Perhaps even some crazy thought in my head. I say, I wish I in Trotro. Why don't we design something for the throttle driver? It is inside the vessel, the vehicle, mm -hmm. so that anybody who has rubbish will put it there. Can put it inside, and when he gets nearest rubbish collection point, he can remove it, 
and put it there so that it's cleanliness. Perhaps if we even make a law and say that if you are driving the vehicle and something is thrown out of your vehicle, we charge you the driver. Yes. That can put some discipline into our system because there's a lot of work for us to do. Mm. Um, I don't intend to veer off our interview today, but speaking to ASB earlier on, she mentioned that the um, time that t uh, it takes us to litigate yeah. it probably is one of the reasons why people do not believe in the police anymore and they want to take the law in their own in their own hands because they feel that if i feel he's an armed robber and i take him to the police the police will tell you that we are going to court today adjournment and all of that so let me do what i want to do to him and be free well let's put it this way we cannot take a holistic attitude it needs cooperation cooperation from all branches the judiciary, the police, we civil society, all of us need to work together. I'll tell you something. Years back, some 30 or 40 years ago, there used to be this question about delay in some criminal issues. And they brought uh, a lawyer who was judge advocate in the military. He called, it was called Finn. And they created a special magistrate court you go there, within a week or a few days, they deal with the your case issue. is disposed of. We actually even at one time created a motor court so that motor offenses go there. It was actually being held in the TUC mm. and it was expeditious. You go there, are you guilty or not guilty? If you say you are not guilty, you are more in trouble. <laughs> it's better you say you are guilty and they'll find you <laughs> And then you go home <laughs> safely rather than, See, because yeah, I, have, I remember once I was there and I saw the lawyer got up and he says, give you this explanation. And then he was going round, round, round. Oh, they imposed a heavy fine on him. On the day yeah, the debris was to show. Mm. So it's a question of cooperation that we can do. If we do that, we even expand the magistracy. We can actually ensure that within a week, a case coming to court, it is disposed of. And if there is a fine, perhaps even custodial sentence is not necessarily necessary. Let them feel it in their pocket. I think it's much better when you find the person and he pays it. The next time he thinks twice. Because mm. sometimes if you're talking about bribing the police and you're not going to pay the fine, it's not the same thing. Yes. So why are you going to bribe the police? So that you, you might as well. Be ah, <laughs> because sometimes we are blaming the police sometimes for things that we are doing ourselves. Yeah. Because we can induce the police exactly. also to accept the brand. Mm. So I think you need a cooperation. The judiciary, the police, government, all of us together can be able to take a holistic approach to this and end this menace that all of us are suffering in. Indeed, it's worrying. But let's get into uh, your book, Sam Okujetsu, and uh, it says, A Life of Service to God and Country. Very beautiful book with he himself on the cover page. And uh, one interesting thing I found in this book is your, your fair skin when you were born. And your mother, I mean, that gave you a lot of titles, especially from your mother, who one of them was what? Governor. Abloti Abloti Yevu. Abloti Yevu. Abloti Yevu. Mm -hmm. that, did that make you feel special or superior? Uh, not superior, not superior, but it's a challenge. You know, when they give you a name, it becomes a challenge for you when they say you are governor. Uh, and we know the colonial time, colonial it governor. the standard high for uh, Exactly. <laughs> but you know, when I went to secondary school, I objected to the name, <laughs> <laughs> only, only to find that the reoccurrence, number one, I had to go to Abruzzi in Truly. Okay. And then I also discovered that I was the first Ghanaian to become a district governor of Rotary. Okay. So, and, and the first lawyer in your hometown. That is also uh, correct. Adidome. Adidome. Great. Adidome. <laughs> so, so the first king and those titles that it ca came with. It was a challenge. Really, really also it did challenges something. You. It, challenge, it, it challenged, challenged, challenged you, and, you and really brought you where yeah, you are. Yeah, because then your attitude of us also, when they say you are Yevu, which means that you are a white man, yes. it means you must also behave like one. <laughs> okay. So it's a challenge. So it means every time you have to be conscious of who you are and 
the way you behave. But one of the things you, you, you were not happy about, you recount how your mother's name and your sister's name played negatively on them. What cue did you learn from that? Well, you know, they always love these funny names. And then sometimes you don't understand the basis for it. Sometimes experiences they go to. That's why they give the name. But then I found out that names actually work like either for or against the individual. Mm. Interestingly, if you actually read the Bible, you will actually notice it there that there is a lot of the names like Jacob, yeah. who is supposed to be a cunning person. And God had to change the name to Israel, Prince. Okay. So you can see that biblically it's always there. The names work against an individual. Okay. And that's why I learned. And so you see, when my mother's name was Sena Fu, I had my daughter called Sena, meaning God's gift. And to me, it's a gift for good, not for bad. Good. Okay. So, and you tell your story from the village where you started, and then finally you ended up in England studying law. At a point, you wanted to do your PhD, and then you were offered another opportunity. And so, and and after all of that, you became a, a full-blown lawyer, and you decided to trace your route back. So you came back to Ghana. Let's look at you as a lawyer, and um, how your child childhood and where you came from played in making you who you are today? Well, you know, there's people who assume that you must be born rich, you must be born into a whole uh, royal family, you must be born into something for you to have. But I, I believe that it does not matter who, where your roots are. It's a question of if you are determined to make it and you work towards it because it's a gift of God, that's true. But then God can give you the talent. If you don't use it correctly, you can end up in disaster. And so the question is how you use that talent. And I always look at life is a challenge. And daily, I'm faced with challenges. And I had to pray to God to enable me to overcome those challenges. In fact, I tell lawyers, I say, if you're going to go to court, pray before you go. Because you don't know the kind of spirit that's going to work on that judge exactly. that you're going to appear before. Mm. And so pray. God might be able to condition him to listen to you. Because sometimes he's there, he shut his ears, or he's thinking about <laughs> something else. <laughs> so all your things <laughs> Ex thing on this. Yeah. Exactly. Mm. So I think it's a challenge that I believe that everybody should appreciate that we need to face daily challenges in life. That the challenges are not meant to be obstacles. I think through each of them, there's always a silver lining at the back. So this is the way that I look at life, mm -hmm. from the village to England, back, and God's grace has propelled me all these years to where I am. You love reading and yes. you love mathematics at yes. the same time. That That's two true. opposite sides. Well, and mostly uh, people who love reading mm -hmm. will hate mathematics. How did you combine the two? Well, <laughs> you know, let's put it this way. Mathematics just tests the mind. Okay. But reading broadens your mind. Okay. I think that's what it's about. I mean, that's the reason why I love history. Okay. Yeah, in the sense that you try to find the lives of other people, what, where they came from, where they have been, and where they are. And then you ask yourself, well, isn't it possible for me also to be that? Yeah. And that challenges you to move up. And therefore, when you're faced with problems, then you don't use that as, a, mm. as an obstacle. Yeah. yeah. But one of the things you said in your book, uh, and it's really touching for me, mm. uh, when you had to pass through a cemetery every day. Ah, yes, where I was at. To home, I mean, to school and, yeah. and, and back from yes. school to yes. home. Yeah. Um, cemetery, normally people will describe it as a, a negative, a no-go area, but you made something positive because you changed your mind towards the cemetery and because of that you walked there freely i probably will run if i get to a cemetery i can't walk well you know it's an issue about fear and uh, i've been in several situations where people say but why are you not afraid then i look at them and say afraid of what 
Because the issue is that when I was a child, when I was quite young, one of my uh, uncles was a hunter. And he told me a story, or told us a story. He says, when the lion is hungry during the daytime, normally the small animal will be hiding in a thicket for fear of the lion. Mm. But the lion is hungry, the lion wants to eat. The lion cannot enter the thicket because the lion runs after animals on the plane. Okay. So what do you think the lion does? He will urinate around the ticket <laughs> and then leave a space where, where there will be no urine. Yeah. And then he will lie in the grass and then he will roar. <laughs> so the animals will be running helter-skelter. Now the smell of the urine, urine is the smell of the lion. Mm. And so they will run, 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 run. Now where do you think they will try to get away from? The little place where yeah, But that's no exactly urine. where the lion is. <laughs> so that was what taught me about fear. Mm. And I, from that time onward, I, the word fear, I thought I'd erased it from my dictionary. So I am not afraid. Because I said, all right, uh, those who are buried in the cemetery, I don't owe them anything, so why should I be afraid of them? <laughs> and I'm not the one who killed <laughs> them. I didn't kill them. Uh, I've not quarreled with them. So why should I be afraid? So I just pray, say the Lord's Prayer, and I walk. <laughs> Your parents must have been proud of you when you returned from England, and you were the first lawyer in your hometown. They were very, very proud. <laughs> Exceedingly exceedingly proud and and your your storytelling skills along the line you yes. developed a storytelling skills and that's you right. say that uh, augmented your law profession yes because you see law is storytelling after all look you are standing before a judge you have to tell the story the person you are representing is not the one speaking you are the one speaking on his of, behalf of his behalf and therefore you have to be able to put the story in such a way and format that can be convincing to the judge mm. And you see the lawyers who don't know how to tell story, they just miss, mess up. And the judge doesn't have that kind of patience listening to rubbish. <laughs> if the thing is not convincing, it's not convincing. That's yeah. all there is to it. So storytelling okay. is so important. Mm. So in my teaching, I do not have to teach my students at the law class that you have to learn to tell the story. Spend time with your client. Understand exactly what the whole issue is about and then virtually have it in your memory. Not go there and start reading. No, no, no. Stand boldly and tell. You can see that it's very convincing to a judge. Let's look at your law profession um, when you came to Ghana. Was it difficult to settle? You said in your book that um, things had not changed so much when you came back from England. How did you manage to settle in and then start being on top? Well, you say settle in, get on top, Sometimes you can just begin to appreciate again, we say, grace. It's only grace. By because grace. if you don't get a good chamber to be in, you can be in a mess. But if you get a decent chamber, like the one that I went to, and then of course my boss was actually a professor at Legon, yeah. so much of the work is being left for me to do. So it's like the child being thrown into the water and say, swim. <laughs> now he has no choice. They say, shuffle your feet, <laughs> move your hand. And so you need you to survive. Do, exactly. So that's how it happened to me. Mm. And uh, one of my boasts was that within six months of my coming, I had visited all the high courts in Ghana because I was being sent to Tamale, Kumasi, Sakandi, Ho. And someone would say, but it's too much for you. But I was enjoying it. Okay. And to the extent that some of the juniors, well, some of the senior lawyer, actually thought that I was practicing for a long time, even though they look at my face. They say, ah, <laughs> you baby, you baby, green you horn. baby, you baby face. <laughs> <laughs> one of them caught me one day because I used to have the directory of the lawyers. Okay. And then when in court, I see the junior sitting down and senior standing up, I go and tell them, I say, you don't respect. <laughs> Get up so that the senior will sit down. See. So one day he asked for the list and I gave it to him. You look at the thing. He said, ah, you be bullying me all the time. I thought you were so senior to me. <laughs> okay, but your intelligence and your um, readiness to learn actually pushed you there because people thought that you were ahead of them when in essence you were not. Exactly. I mean, that's, the, you know, the important thing about law is the fact that you must have the desire to learn. 
because it's not your brilliance in the classroom. That has nothing to do with what happens in the actual court. In the court system, you have to master the case. You have to know the facts. You have to know the authorities that you needed to cite and be prepared at any moment. You know, I've been to court where one of my colleagues will come and say, oh, I have another case somewhere, so hold my brief. <laughs> and I say, sit down. <laughs> Tell me what the problem is about. Because when you go, the judge might, if I say I'm representing you, I'm saying that I'm holding your brief. He say, what's the matter about? I have to what know do I have to what exactly. do I say. So I have to master the whole issue within a few minutes. Before and the man is gone. The judge come, call the case and say, I said I'm holding so and so and so brief. What is it about? And you start rattling. I am addressing the judge. You may think I'm brilliant. No, it's not a question <laughs> of being brilliant. It's just that I learned the technique. You learned the technique. Yeah. And, and that is what it is with the law profession. Absolutely. You need to learn the technique. That is you so. shouldn't allow the law to, to just, you passing through the law. But the law must pass through That's you. Really exactly. So, you, you are the embodiment of it. <laughs> but you take inspiration from Mahatma Gandhi. Yes. And one of the interesting quotes you, you've lived by is uh, to live as if you're going to die tomorrow exactly. and to learn as if you're going to live forever. forever. That's what, correct. How does that inspire you? Well, you see, the important thing for us to appreciate is that you live for a moment. Because you don't know when you are going to be called. It's like, go oh, and see, and say, oh, uh, I will do this so and so and so, period. I say, how are you so sure? I say, look, if you read your Bible carefully, it says that you are only a vapor. And I even change it and I said, you are only a puff of breath. And even that is loaned to you. And the owner can call for it at any time without notice. So be prepared. And if you have been a Boy Scout or girl guy, you know they say, be prepared. That's the motto. All the time you must be prepared. So for every moment, you must be prepared because you don't know mm. what the situation is going to be like. Uh, your mother had how many children? Three children? Eleven. 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 But three with your father. Yes. Only three with your father. father. But your father had 53 children. Correct. Did that affect your upbringing in any no, way? No, not at all. I mean, people say, ah. But you were so many, I say, yes. We were not all living in one house at a time. <laughs> we live in different places, but we know each other. I respect all of them. That was the thing of the time. At that time, if you have a little bit of money, you can marry so many wives. Mm. But then, you also learn lessons from it and say, because it happened, you should not be a victim to that one as well. Yeah. So, of course, there will be jealousies. As you can see, this mother's child and that mother's child or something happened and then someone might even insult your mother. But you take it all in good stride hmm. and said, well, it doesn't matter. Less. As I want my siblings. I Did said, it make you a strong person? Yes, I tell my siblings, I say, there is only one blood which is in you and in me. Yes. So irrespective of what mother we brothers. are. Brothers. We are brothers and we are sisters. sisters. Mm. That's all that matters. Were you at a point uh, broken down because of probably how your stepmothers treated you and so you were like, I've given up? No. That is actually the beauty of what has happened to me was the fact that I take everything in stride. Um, I always say that out of evil comes good. And so you might, somebody might think I see them all treating you. But then you learn from it. If I'm a man and I'm being asked to grant pepper, <laughs> I would have thought that that's a woman's, uh, a, girl, a girl's job. Yeah. So you go and you grind it. But what happened eventually? You know, when I was a student, I lived in digs for a number of months, and thereafter I was on my own. I was cooking my own food. <laughs> how did I know how to cook? How because she, she I was brought up by my stepmother to do all the jobs so I know how to, to cook. Do. Whatever is it I can cook. Mm. If I you know when I got married at the beginning, I was the one doing you know, much of the cooking. <laughs> now my wife is the expert. I, I know that law law is it's not morality. Law is not religion. But you're very religious. How yes. do you combine religion with law? Um, do you sometimes feel guilty that of course on the face of morality this uh, the plaintiff could have been right but on the face of the evidence of prima facie uh, i mean the case had to go other the other way around well there is actually 
not that much difference between law and morality, as sometimes we put it. Because in law there is ethics, and the ethics is moral. The truth, of course, is the fact that I am a Christian, I'm proud to be a Christian, I'm a believer. But that also did not happen overnight. Uh, when I was young, I had good memory, so I can, religious class, I can recite almost passage by passage in the Bible. But then, something else had happened to me. Because my political encounters locked me up in prison. Wow. Three times I was in prison. A chaplain sent me there. Uh, 13 weeks and one day, people say, ah, what did you do? I say I was part of the movement for freedom and justice. Nanado was with me at the time. Well, he was able to escape to the country, <laughs> but I, I found myself <laughs> with his uncle. Oh, really? they, locked us, they locked us up. He was in Oshafort, I was in uh, Jamesport. <laughs> uh, the two of us took a champion to court. Wow, interesting. Uh, I'll, I'll come to your political life, but okay. looking back uh, as a lawyer then, yeah. and now the state of the judiciary, what would you say? Has there been much change? Uh, would you say it's getting better? Well, I must confess that the current Chief Justice has done a lot to bring about reformation in the system. Uh, we brought processes now whereby, for example, you, f you file your pleadings, you can even file your addresses in court instead of the viva voce, which makes it easier even for the judge to write the judgment. And of course, you can see the court structures that have been put in place. She's improved the salaries of the, um, of the judges, which actually has made a whole host of difference to the system. And uh, I think the first lady, a judge, has actually lifted the bar very, very, very high. In fact, she's left a legacy which is going to be difficult for anybody else to, to cover. So that actually had brought a lot of change mm. within the system. Of course, I must confess that we were fewer lawyers, the country was smaller, and the judges were articulate, they were very well comported, and it was a joy at that time. In fact, sometimes I had to cite some of the occurrences at that time to the newer ones to appreciate that this question about adjournment, adjournment that you were complaining about a few minutes ago with the police, mm. is to say that it was not so before. Okay. That normally in the magistrate's court, it's supposed to be a court of first instance. Mm. And so normally, the people know it. So when you come, they arrange the charges to you. What's your situation like that? They can still say, stand down. They go through the matter, go into the witness box. Mm. <laughs> so would you say the judicial cor uh, corruption scandal has been dealt with uh, well so that people will gain back confidence in the judiciary? Well, let's say you cannot say that it was done well. I think it was a, a start. A start to put, put it mildly to, as a threat to whoever is a judge to appreciate that. The person you're taking the bribe from, you don't know who he is. He might go and report you. Yeah. And therefore, it's in your own interest not to. To take it. After all, you're being paid a salary. And you're being paid reasonable salary. Mm. Some of them, if they are practicing at the bar, they will not even earn what they're earning. Exactly. And therefore, you should be content with that. And do the work that you are assigned to do. Mm. Instead of this underhand thing. And because some of the scandal was just too much for me. I mean, what can you talk about goat. Why? You cannot go and buy goat meat. <laughs> why should you go and say you are sleeping with a woman? I mean, there are thousands of women around. Out there. So why, why should you do that as a, a you know, a, 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 taking a bait of that nature? It was so scandalous. And I'm praying that this should be a lesson to all the young people because I think what is happening now is that there is too much craving for money. And this was not the time when some of us started to practice. The issue was not money. The issue was, let me achieve distinction in my profession. Are you satisfied with the way it's being handled? No, I don't think so. Because I teach the students, and I know it. I'm talking to them about morality, about ethics. And then I'm looking at their faces, and I say, you know, I can read your minds. There are many of you, when you go out from here, 
you will do the opposite of what I'm teaching you. And strangely, you know what happens? I am a member of the disciplinary committee. So I'm there, and then complaint is made against the lawyer. I turn back, I look at his face, and I say, were you not my student? He says, yes. Yeah. Is that what I taught so I say, is that what I taught you? <laughs> and then you can see them shaking. So I think that is, that is just the desire for young people not to be like the old ones. You know, they see you in a car, they also want to own you. I say, in the old days, we don't do it like that. You start gradually from bicycle to maybe a motorcycle to a small BMW. Gradually, you build up your reputation. How do we deal with this, Uncle Sam? Because uh, the uh, judiciary or the law, uh, there seems to be some deterioration because the law used to be a very respected profession Absolutely. and people will not uh, stoop low yeah. to some of these things. How do we resolve this? But you know what's happening now? People think that everybody should be a lawyer. So, so many universities are springing up day and night and they are all offering law courses. Law course. I am against it. Then some even think that the law school, we should expand it to us. And I say, which country in the world have you seen? Expanding. So expanding, just training lawyers for the sake of training lawyers. What is the need for it? What is the system to absorb the people you are training? For you, how should it be handled? Because people are also complaining about the law school, how people uh, find it very difficult to go to the law school. How Correct. should it be It should be handled? difficult. Everywhere in the world is difficult. You don't just walk into a law school. Everywhere there are entrance examinations that eliminate the people. And even in America where they even go and get their JD, many drop out. Sometimes even half the intake does not complete the course. They are thrown out. And then when you finish the course, now you must take the state exam. And not many pass. Many of them go and find something else to do. Why is it that we think that here you can use political pressure to just call yourself a lawyer? I don't believe it is correct. But it, probably because the, the Ghana Legal Council has been uh, charged or chastised sometimes that uh, sometimes they do some favoritism. No, there's no favoritism. I have been a teacher there for 22 years. What is the favoritism? They are not the one marking the exam. The General Legal Council is not marking the exam. They are only an examining body. They have examiners who set the questions. They have people who mark the scripts, and then they tabulate the result. The result is given to the council, and the council approves it. That's all. Mm. So I don't see what the favoritism comes into it. Well, uh, let's come to your political life. You've been, you were a former member of North Tong, and a member of parliament for North Tong. That was that, in that what, is correct. That was in what year? 17? That was 69 to 72. Great. Um, looking back at when you were a member of parliament and all the issues that have surrounded parliament, we've seen the corruption allegation, bribery and corruption allegation, all the uh, left fingers that has been pointed to that house. What would you say is wrong with the current parliament? Well, the current parliament, of course, is too big. That's another problem because we're just increasing the number, increasing the numbers, and I keep warning that we, we, we are getting something, equation not correct. Because you see, when the Americans start uh, redistricting, what they do is that they just adjust according to population. They don't increase numbers. If they were increasing the number, how many people do you think will be in Congress? <laughs> After all, they have 3 million, I tell you what, 300 million population. Yeah. What are you? You're only 20 something. Yeah. So you're just increasing numbers. Mm. So that in itself also has a problem because then it means the cost involved. At our time, we were being given some small allowance. Now they are being paid handsomely. So that should be enough for them to appreciate that the nature of the work that they are going to do. This so-called corruption that has come up, whether it is real or not, I do not know. Because you remember the last one that we all saw. It did not make any sense. Because if you have uh, uh, an absolute majority in parliament, why will a candidate for a ministerial position go and pay a bribe to be vetted? It, it defies logic. So some of them may not be true. But indeed, if there is corruption in parliament. What it requires is to have a proper system in place that can check it. Because part of the drawback we have is that we have the Commission for 
uh, human rights, and they are supposed to investigate, but they are not resourced. Mm. And because they are not resourced, a lot of the complaints about corruption go undetected. And when you take Eoko, it was ten as well. Sometimes it's like a political unit you use it against your opponent <laughs> rather than, you know, a legitimate institution to check again corruption. Then you take the Auditor General report. The scandals that come there. Unfortunately, again, you find out that some of them are coming two or three years after the event. And then the machinery to prosecute the people and even get the money back from them is also not being effectively done. Mm -hmm. But if these things can be done, where people have taken money, you go and you sell their property to defray the cost to the state, it will act as a deterrent. Mm. Council, we are running out of time, but I can't let you go without asking this question. You said uh, so many good things about the uh, current uh, Chief Justice. Would you say there were some low points for her and which uh, the incoming Chief Justice would have to build on? Well, the new one has been working with her all the time. Uh, so, and of, well, fortunately or unfortunately for me, I'm on the disciplinary committee, and the new one, the incoming, is actually my chair. So okay. I've been working with her continuously. So I work with both of them continuously, and I know both of them very well. I think uh, Justice Wood has laid down a good foundation, which I'm very, very sure that when uh, Justice Akufo is... Uh, approved by Parliament, that she will continue from that same vein. Does she have what it takes? Oh, that she's tough. Oh, she's a tough nut. She does not tolerate rubbish <laughs> at all. That one I can assure you. I can assure you. OK. <laughs> now time for my surprise. And um, we have uh, Madame Joyce Ayer on the phone, who contributed in putting this book together. Hello. Joyce, okay, I'm told it's I, not I. Yes, I She's Executive yeah. Director of Salt and Light Ministry. Right. She's on the line. Good evening to you. Thanks for joining Good evening, us. Good Uncle Sam. This is double joy. Oh, double, <laughs> double, double indeed. <laughs> nice to hear your voice. Oh, yes, and I'm so proud of you, Uncle Sam. Well, you are proud so, of me, so just proud as I'm of a, you. So I am also <laughs> exceptionally proud of you. <laughs> you, are, you are such an inspiration <laughs> for the rest of us. And... Uh, my prayer is that when I get to your age, uh, I, will, I will surprise you by, by assuring you that you trained me well and I'm doing well. You surely will. <laughs> by, by his grace, I'm sure you will. Amen. And I'm happy Amen. that the Lord is using you in a mighty way in this Hallelujah. country of ours. We praise him for Hallelujah. you. Thank you. Thank and so you. Sam, may the Lord continue to bless you and uh, wrap you around in his love. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Amen. my dear. Thank amen you. and amen. Auntie amen. Joy, mm -hmm. thanks so much for Thank passing you. through. So mm -hmm. how do we get yeah. these books? Where can we get copies to purchase? Uh, this book is being sold actually in the bookshops. Uh, I think, uh, what's his name? Challenge. Challenge has it. What are the other books? Uh, she's sitting there. She should be keeping it. Kingdom, Kingdom Bookshop. Uh, Kingdom. Kingdom also has it. Uh, um, the EP, yeah, EP, 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 yeah, EP, 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 Yes, all of them have a uh, copy, but you can actually buy it online also. Okay, how uh, much is it going for? It is a hundred. Hundred. Yes, a hundred Ghana cities. Okay, yes. so uh, we are indeed grateful having Uncle Sam with us in the studio. It's been a very beautiful conversation with you. The joy, the Thanks. joy. Is so the much. joy is mine. Thanks so much for coming. God bless you and, you and continue to keep you for us. Some of us will come to you for legal advice. No and problem. You're that, welcome. <laughs> that's how uh, we'll be drawing the curtains uh, on the pulse.